Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here. Happy New Year. 2023 has just started. We've got two Martin neck resets on the go here. Uh, what I've got here is I've added the shims to the male dovetail with a thin down version of hide glue. I wrap the whole dovetail in a very thin sort of saran wrap and then I press it into place. This is how I glue those shims on. Now on the other tech deck I have a D28 that I'm doing a neck reset on as well and this one the neck was reset before and, and there are complications on this one that I had to deal with and I'll bring into the loop as we make those corrections. I have a piece of tape here and I have masked off the tip exposing about a millimeter a little bit better than a millimeter on the tip and I'm going to start with the die grinder. Now, not, not everybody does this, and you don't want to even attempt it unless you're very comfortable with this tool. There we go. There's a fresh 100 grit disc. And I am taking mostly glue off at this point. So the last time that the neck was removed for a reset, there was way too much material taken off the inside cheek. Now ironically, even after doing that, they never managed to actually get the neck reset properly to, and they ended up shaving down the bridge. So because of the extra material that was removed from the inside cheek of the heel, it meant that the whole neck shifted this way. And the theoretical line for the intonation is here. The actual compensated line is here. So that was another complication that needed to be dealt with because literally where that saddle is, this guitar would never play in tune. Okay, I am happy now with the next set. I've brought it back. You can see out of desperation on that last neck reset, he ended up shaving the bridge down way too thin. So now with this new neck angle, now there's a little bit of room for adjustment. It will end up being slightly lower than this, but I am going to be fabricating a replacement bridge that will be sort of standard Martin thickness. Okay, we have given those shims enough time to set. And we'll just take that off. So we'll let that dry right out, bone dry, overnight, and then we'll gently work that down until we get a perfect mechanical fit. Now, as per usual, after tilting the neck back, that creates the fall off of the fingerboard extension, so you inevitably get this high spot here. So I start with my shorter block, and we're just going to kind of blend that high spot in with the fingerboard extension. This is the smallest block that I send out in the fretting kits. And that's really concentrating right on that point. Just kind of stopping and checking as I go. Oh, that's made a that's made quite a difference. So for you guys that have your sanding blocks that I've uh, sent out in those fretting kits, this is that crepe stuff that you buy in a block uh, for cleaning up the sandpaper on your belt sanders, edge sanders, etc. But it also works on these sanding blocks. So this 80 grit is pretty well jammed full with uh, rosewood and ebony dust because, you know, just from the last few fingerboards I've done. So I just take the edge of that and just kind of manually basically renew it. Well, I've already sanded multiple fingerboards with this one piece of 80 grit. Of course, I do my leveling with 80 grit 
and finish up with 180 actually but uh, a couple of moments ago that was jammed solid with uh, rosewood and ebony dust now we're ready to use it again it's completely refreshed check. and you gotta stop and check as you go now this of course does not have an adjustable truss rod it's the old style Martin with the with a square truss rod, not adjustable. So that's the famous 10 inch straight edge that I sent out in the kits. And that's looking pretty good. I'm going to switch over to the lighter grade now. This is my 120 grit, and again, I'm just refreshing it with this uh, crepe block. I don't know if the camera's picking that up or not, but there's the part I just cleaned. There's the other end I haven't touched yet. So I'll clean that up. And so there we go. That block is now completely refreshed. And now we're going full length, light touch here. There's a slope of leather on this jointed block that naturally follows whatever radius I'm working on from 7 and a quarter to 22. And we are just about there, just about ready to start putting the new frets in. So this is the setup that I use for tapping those upper frets in before the neck is glued onto the guitar. So I've got my the table from my arbor press is straddled across the two rails of the GPS tack deck. Then I've got this tapered solid maple block, piece of two-sided tape. I have a female dovetail cut into the end of that block to receive the male dovetail. And then that piece of double-sided tape just kind of holds that down while we're doing our work. Now I'm not worried about these frets. I'll put those in after the neck is glued on the guitar. It's just the fingerboard extension. That's what I'm worried about. This way the actual body of this vintage Martin, it never gets a hit. Now I do realize a lot of my subscribers are hockey fans and you've seen me use hockey pucks for numerous things over the last 700 videos and I'm sure that most of you have been watching the World Juniors so I thought I should fess up before you find out. This latest hockey puck trick I actually stole it from Connor Bedard. So I have this sliced hockey puck that I put over the fret and that gives us the pressure we need to keep both those tips down tight as we're gluing the fingerboard extension on the neck reset. So I have a fret here at the fourth fret and between that and this upper fret that gives me a really good idea of the trajectory of the neck. And this is approximate, but about a half an inch to five-eighths of an inch is what you want to see the distance from the surface of the soundboard to the underside of the sixth string. And that is what we're going to end up with, so I'm very happy with that.
Well, it looks like this is the first time this bridge has ever been off. Whew! Thank goodness for that. No lumber missing there, right on the glue line. So we will use this bridge as a template to make our replacement bridge. I'm going to do my best to sort of explain the steps that I took to make this replacement bridge. So I've got a chunk of ebony on the bottom there. Obviously use the original bridge and the footprint of that original bridge as my trace plate. Now it is incrementally bigger, not very much, just a whisper, a few thou all the way around. Now a critical part of course is drilling those holes. So I started with a 732nd inch diameter bit taping this in place and I drilled through and just spotted that angle so less than an eighth of an inch deep for all six holes. Once that was done this is on the drill press of course once that was done I took my 3 16th inch bit and held this sandwich very loosely. I wanted it to kind of float so that the smaller bit, the 3 16th inch bit, which I through drilled, it allowed that 3 16th inch bit to find the center of the larger bit. That's why I didn't hold this tightly. I held it very loosely until it found center. Then I held it and through drilled. And, and that gave me six perfectly spaced holes. Of course, we've got breakout on the underside, and that's okay because we're going to take care of that next. So, this is what we have here. So what I measured was from the edge of the wing to the top of the ramp and made it equidistance on both sides from the outside of the ramp to this line. So next I cut this piece of tape. Pull that off. And this is for obvious reasons because you're not going to see a pencil line on this black ebony, that's for sure. Now we'll go over to my edge sander. Okay. So this is the top of the ramp, and that's what I'm going to cut next. So let me show you how I do this. Okay, the next step, I'm reaming a tapered hole with my bridge pin reamer. It's really just the two outside ones I need. So I'm reaming that. Now I'm turning this dowel. Just cut that off in the band saw. thin out. So I'm looking to, I want to make these ramps a little thinner, but I want to take it off the bottom because if you remember, we had a little bit of breakout here. We're going to take care of that breakout on the underside and we're going to thin this down. This is too thick from where it is right now. And 
and of course these give us something to hang on to. Turning this on with the foot switch. Okay. doesn't matter where I place this on the disc because the disc has a spherical radius so it's like the outside of a ball 48 feet high. Okay that is taken care of all the breakout. We've thinned the edge of those ramps down the outside tips of the bridge are like they should be. Back to the guitar. I'm very gently brushing off the glue. I don't want to take any wood here. I'm just... Thank goodness this is the only time this bridge has been on. So I didn't take any lumber when we heated that up. This is a stiff 120 grit. I'm careful not to push too hard. I don't want it to flex to the shape of my finger. So the next thing I'm checking is the height of this bridge. I can see that it's still a little bit thick, but that's okay. So what we want to do is we want to take this, we're going to flatten the top of this bridge where we're going to re-slot for the new compensated saddle. So we want that straight edge to just breeze over top of that bridge as we run it along the trajectory of the fret crowns. We are very close now. Front. So this is the front view of both bridges, the original one that was shaved down, and the actual height that it should be. There's our top view. This slot will be cut after the bridge is glued on the guitar. Because the neck has been displaced to a new location, we'll do the math and figure out where this slot is going to be. So that's our aerial view. There's our back view. Now this will be softened a bit. I will sand it and it will also be stained black. I think I'm going to call it a day. We will keep you in the loop as we move along on this one.
The joiner table is surface ground, so it is dead flat. And this was the main reason I designed that uh, disc sander conversion kit for a drill press. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to slot that bridge. We'll do the math, calculate where that slot should be in the replacement bridge, and we'll do it once it's glued on the guitar. Well, this is definitely a watershed moment for this D28 rescue. You have seen this in other videos, but I thought, I thought I'd show you again how I set up to glue a bridge on. Of course the foot of that bridge has a 48 foot spherical radius, sort of like a very shallow suction cup full of glue. So this chunk of hockey puck allows me to clear all the braces on the inside and get And that is my little call that I uh, put in the center and it has a bit of a radius on it as well and that pulls the bridge down nice and tight my little blocks also have a little bit of a radius to put the pressure right on those outside tips and these are the 3 16 inch threaded rods I use That is what went on the inside, up against the bridge plate. Well, this is one of those very rare cases where the soundboard did not split. I'm just wicking that naphtha under there to loosen up the adhesive. Well, it looks like I spoke too soon about the absence of cracks. There is a crack here, and we're going to deal with that right now. Got some thin down hide glue. Just a couple of little slivers here.
We'll let that set for about 40 minutes. So while I was waiting for that hide glue to set, I went ahead and cut and beveled and polished the rest of the fret so we can finish this fret job. We'll be setting up in a minute to slot the bridge. I've already done the math on that. I just thought I'd bring you in for a good look at that heel on the treble side. And there's the heel on the base. Oh, the other thing, one of the most important things I want to point out is the actual trajectory along the top of the crowns to the bridge. We're just kissing, and this is a little thicker than I wanted, so this will work out perfect. Usually the bridge has a little bit of a curvature on the crown. So we're going to slot it first, and then I'll shave it down so that that straight edge just breezes over top. It's just about there in the center. On the sides, of course, it's budding in about a sixteenth of an inch down, and that's, that's normal. So when we're done, that straight edge will just gliss all the way across, and we will now be able to set the action anywhere we want. Okay, we are all set up, ready to make the cut. I'll bring you in for a second to just show you this template. So this template is basically a duplicate of the Bosch Colt router. And that center pin represents that eighth inch diameter bit we're going to use to cut the bridge slot. I use these two clips for my start of cut and end of cut. And now I'm just going to adjust the depth on the router and make the cut. Okay, I've got it so it's just touching. Just go a little deeper. And with this slot location, we will intonate this guitar perfectly. And that is the angle that we're after. Tomorrow morning we cut a nut and a saddle, do the final calibration, string it up, and play it.
just to give you an idea, that is how thinned that original bridge was shaved down. Now we're back to regular height. We pretty well got a half inch from the soundboard surface to the underside diameter of the low E string. And that generates plenty of tension to set this soundboard in motion. And as you just saw with the tuning test, no tuning issues anymore with this one. That saddle is right where it should be and we've managed to squeak in all six strings. And that is our string alignment side to side. There's not a lot of forgiveness on this one. But that's lined up nicely both sides of the fingerboard. So at last we can go in and play this guitar. Well, this guitar definitely got the full treatment. As you saw, the original bridge was shaved down to nothing, so I made that replacement bridge. A cantilevered compensated bone saddle, and of course a compensated nut. The biggest part of this job was getting the neck off cleanly after the last failed neck reset, and resetting it to the proper angle, which meant leveling the fingerboard and complete refret. So yeah, this this was a big job. But it is the iconic Martin D28, 1967 no less. Anyway, you gotta hear this thing. You can see this is made to be played. Look at the wear on it. But all the stuff that counts now is there. Plays silky smooth, perfectly in tune, and it's super stable. For those of you who are following my channel, you would have seen this guitar in the last video. It was quite the undertaking, but well worth the effort. For those of you who follow my channel, you'll know that I like to kind of jump position. I saw a video of Tommy Emanuel, a short video, of him giving tuning tips. And he was saying in this video that it's not just enough to plug into a tuner and watch the needle. You want to play all over the neck. So I tend to do a couple of things. I'll play the same chord in different positions as A major, A major 7th in this case. A major 9. And I'll also do some diatonic progressions again jumping position first position and then seventh position fifth position second position tenth position twelfth position Garden variety C chord in three different positions. 
D and G. 